Um, hello, everyone. I'm Bing Wang from Beijing Institute for Art General Artificial Intelligence. And it's my great pleasure to chair the 18th session of Asia Graphics webinar. And today we invited two great speakers. Um, they, are, they are Professor Taku Kumura from the University of Hong Kong and Professor Li Bin Liu from Peking University. Uh, in the following, they are going to introduce their recent works on character animation and assimilation as well. So let's start uh, the first one. And the first talk will be given by Professor Taku Kumura. Um, I think everyone in computer graphic community, uh, computer uh, in character animation community know Taku very, very well. His work such as PFNN, MNN, and ManipNet are very impressive and have inspired a lot of many following up works. It also includes two of my works on camera motion control. And I would say thank you to Taku here. And in the very recent years, I'm also very exciting to find he also start to extend his work in the physical based simulation field. I'm sure he will bring a lot of fresh ideas in the simulation community as well. Okay. Let's welcome Taku to give us his first, uh, his talk, which is entitled Periodic Autoencoder for Character Animation and Isotropic Arab Energy Using Cauchy Green Invariance. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I should uh, share my screen. Mm -hmm. And do this and then then I do that. Next, I share the sound, maybe. Share the sound. Okay. Yeah, I saw um, the screen. Yes, uh, sorry, I misunderstood the time of it. <laughs> I thought it was starting an hour okay. later. <laughs> okay. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, sorry for uh, starting late. So uh, thanks to Bing for the introduction. Um, so I describe about two of our recent works, uh, one about the motion synthesis and uh, the other about um, this uh, recent work about uh, isotropic power of energy. Okay, and uh, so, uh, well, we are, yeah, because uh, just to give a justification of doing this research, uh, so, yeah, because of the COVID, we were isolated a lot. And so we had to, like, you know, there was some, uh, you know, demand for talking with your friends over the internet. And maybe you want to show your virtual, um, you know, avatar. And uh, so we want to have, like, and so for doing this, you want to show your facial animation realistic and you want to, you, show some realistic character movements, which is the motion of your avatar. And also when doing moving around, probably you want to show a realistic cloth deformation, which is the cloth you're wearing. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we, uh, we also did some research about the facial animation, which is driven by the speech. Uh, maybe I just show a quick video of this. So this is a work from last year's uh, CVPR. Sad white boy, perturbed woman, angry blue man and a green guy. 얼굴 애니메이션은 가상 현실과 같은 많은 응용 프로그램에서 개발되었습니다. L'animazione facciale è stata sviluppata in molte applicazioni come la realtà virtuale. Sad white boy. So that, so that was the the facial animation part, uh, so, but uh, this is not uh, described in this talk. So if interested, please uh, check the paper. And so for today, I first talk about the periodic autoencoder for animating full body motion. So this was from SIGGRAPH last year. And then about this isotropic RF energy for, yeah, for, deform for simulating the, the deformation of objects, yeah. And uh, so uh, first I start from the periodic autoencoder for learning motion phase manifolds. Uh, this is the work done uh, by uh, Sebastian Stark and Ian Mason uh, together with myself. And uh, 
so here is a visualization of like a, you know, of the generated motion together with plots and um, phase manifold at where the characters are moving. And uh, you can see that uh, it's kind of a periodic motion can have, be mapped to these uh, points in this phase manifold. And so we're here is showing these different movements of walking in different styles and like doing this football and also like the quarter motion as well as the dancing motion. Yeah, so uh, this kind of like a time series model, it has been, uh, you know, re researched a lot in the in the the machine learning domain. And basically, we wish to like predict the pose of the character in the next frame using the pose in the previous frame. And uh, lots of um, research has been done for proposing this kind of uh, models. And when when doing this, um, yeah, so like uh, usually people talk about this, uh, you know, ambiguity in the future. So if you just try to like train uh, LSTM or whichever uh, simple, you know, off the shelf model using these uh, time series, mo the motion capture data, you, there, there's a there's a chance that you have fallen into some average pose. Uh, so that was, uh, well, I think this is was usually known in the old days, yeah. And uh, another thing that uh, main issue that uh, people don't talk much about this is about this uh, transition motions are 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 very sparse, yeah. So, uh, well, I think I talk about this in several places already, so you may be familiar. But um, for example, like you have like this kind of like a a sidestepping motion and the running motion, which are in this uh, visualized in you know samples in the high dimensional space. So these are red dots and like the blue dots are of course are poses corresponding to the sidestepping and the running motion. And then uh, like you want to like put this into the into this time series model and learn uh, these different movements. Yeah. And actually, so the, uh, you know, these blue dots and red dots, so they are for these uh, individual movements like sidestepping and, and running, they are, you know, the samples are very dense, yeah. And so there's no problem when you are like synthesizing only the sidestepping motion or the, only the running motion, yeah. So they're, because they are very dense, you put, the system can learn the motions very well. But the problem happens when there is like a transitions between the movements. So here is like you use this uh, some something like a LSTM to like generate uh, this character motion, and then you try, try to like quickly switch the direction where which is going to correspond to some transition motion. Yeah. And so like uh, the the cases the situations that you know this transition motion is usually very very sparse yeah so there's lots of samples where there is like these individual movements but the transition motion is very sparse and when you like dump all these samples into the neural network actually they don't know how to do the transition between the movements yeah and then uh, they they just uh, simply blend between some of the samples and then the results appear bad that's one interpretation of the problem here. Yeah, so for so coping with this, uh, you, know, you know, like introducing this phase label was one thing that we have been considering. And so like you can define the phase as the, when the right foot landing onto the ground is zero and then left foot landing onto the land is pi and right foot landing onto the ground is two pi again. And then uh, you can like uh, this this kind of a rule is very consistent between for between all kinds of locomotion. So the side stepping and running and walking, they always follow this kind of a rule. And so this is uh, useful for like we, when you have this kind of a different uh, kind of like um, what uh, locomotion, you can have these phase labels added, and then you can do some uh, find the correspondences between the poses. Yeah. So then it's going to be easier for the system to find which pose corresponds to which and how the transition should happen when this uh, you know, transition is happening uh, from the user control signal. Yes, and so that's how we, uh, we were, you know, one of the merits of this uh, phase function neural network that uh, was uh, proposed by us a long time ago. And so here it was like the neural network ways were like, you know, um, what the function by the phase 
variable uh, and if I'm using the phase of these uh, control points, which are all in the form of this uh, you know, and, uh, and this uh, network weights are interpolated to like uh, calculate to some special specialized uh, weights for uh, each phase of the locomotion. Yeah. And so, the, uh, so that it's a time series model. So the next pose is predicted from the previous pose with the user control signal. So that's uh, how uh, we've been working on this uh, for, for producing this kind of a locomotion. And for we also did uh, the same similar work for like uh, you know, interaction of character with environment, and also like for like more complex movements like this kind of a basketball. Uh, you know, we were we could like define a phase for the you know, contacts between the individual limbs and the object or environment. Uh, we also did some motion stylization based on this idea. And so the uh, the problem is like uh, you know in all these uh, examples we had to like you know define uh, this uh, phase variable. So for the locomotion it was like this left foot right foot contact, and also for this kind of a interaction with the environment it was also defined based on the contacts between the body and these objects yeah so same for this uh, basketball so like defining this kind of a uh, rules for the phase is something that is uh, somewhat manual so which is not very uh, great so uh, in this uh, periodic autoencoder we were uh, what's trying to overcome this uh, limitation so what uh, by, by like trying to learn these kind of phases automatically from the motion capture data. Yes. So the procedure is that you give this kind of like a local uh, the, all the motion capture data in the in the in the form of the joint joint velocities and uh, sorry the joint joint position yeah the 3D joint velocities and then uh, we pass it through the convolution layer. And then uh, we do reducing this dimensionality and like, you know, for these uh, smaller number of channels, we uh, apply this FFT uh, to compute like these uh, parameters and the frequency domain, which includes like the amplitude and the, you know, the offsets and also like the, and, and also like uh, we have another small uh, and also the frequency sorry and then they, they have another um, you know small network to predict these phases within these motions yeah and then uh, so they are converted into the frequency domain and then you can use the, the you know the sine cosine functions to like reconstruct the you know the motions in the feature space and then do the deconvolution to reconstruct the motion again yeah, and then uh, by using these uh, parameters that are in the frequency domain, we can like try to to, to we can try to construct um, a latent space. Uh, so we call this the phase manifold. And if you plot these uh, samples uh, using PCA, then uh, you you can see that um, the motion appears uh, more nicer in this uh, phase manifold, which are shown in the bottom. Yeah, and so. Um, so it was now, uh, yeah, so we the claim is that it's going to be like easier to search for motions or use these parameters uh, by using these parameters for the time series model, we can like synthesize uh, motions more and nicer. Yeah, and also like, uh, you know, by uh, analyzing these kind of movements in this uh, phase manifold that we can like uh, see, uh, you know, various, you know, cyclic features of the motion. So if it's like a sing, uh, ordinary locomotion, you will see a single cycle. If it's like a motion where you have like two cycles, like arms rotating while walking, then you will see this kind of two cycles. And finally, if it's like a random dancing motion, you will see like a, you know, this kind of like a multiple cy cycles, you know, randomly interact, intermoving, yeah. And so, so, uh, yeah, so so now we can use these, uh, you know, phase variables uh, or like the, you know, frequency domain variables as a, as an additional input for the time series model. So these are going to be like the input and then uh, we can predict the next pose and these uh, parameters in the phase manifold are also predicted. And so we can do some, uh, you know, time series uh, recursive uh, re recurrent motion synthesis. Yeah. And uh, so let me quickly show some of the results. So uh, these motions are like this kind of like football or like, uh, you know, motions in different type, uh, motion styles and uh, quadruped and dancing. And so here's the visualization of the results for this 
locomotion and quadruped. And uh, so you can see that uh, motions and these uh, different styles. Yeah. And so for the for quadruped motion, like uh, you can see that uh, there are you know, there, there's a tail motion and the, the motions. And if you use these, um, we use the previous approaches, uh, the tail movements tend to be less uh, vivid. And by using uh, this uh, phase manifold, we can have like a good uh, vivid tail motion. And uh, here is another example of like uh, doing some running and different styles. And so you can see that uh, our system can like, handle different styles of uh, locomotion. And so if we use the PFNN, um, we could have issues with the motion of synthesizing like the the arms uh, because they because if the if the arm movements are not really following the the you know phases of the legs, then the arm movements can be more ambiguous. Also, it couldn't handle like this kind of like a motion where the legs are not moving in a left and right you know, you know alternate pattern. And uh, so here is another example of doing this kind of a football. And uh, you can see that the ball is like responding to the motion of uh, the legs. And then uh, it's somewhat like uh, the, the, uh, the ball motion is actually generated by physics. And it's like, uh, you know, moved based on the collisions between the legs and the ball, uh, the feet. Yeah. And finally, uh, showing this kind of like a dancing motion where the character is like uh, responding to the dance movements. And so the, the sound features are, are, you know, the frequency features are computed and used as uh, additional input for the, for, the, for the motion synthesis, yeah. And uh, so here is the, is the dancing com compared to the bass lines. You can see uh, the motion quality is better with the proposed method. And uh, well, although it's uh, less creative, yeah, actually, it's some of the motion that the, the motion that the pattern it can be created is just limited to those training data. And uh, but uh, you can see that the dance motion can be you know, a different dance motion appears when the, the music style changes. Yeah, so. You can see that uh, when the music is is more, uh, yeah, is uh, slower, there's different movements up here. Yeah. So in in summary, so here we propose this, um, you know, a uh, new approach of this periodic auto encoder such that we can compute these uh, features in the frequency domain, and uh, so they they're actually also a good. Uh, feature useful for motion matching as well. Yeah, because the motion is, uh, the features are in the frequency domain, actually it computes some feature of the, a longer window of motion. So it's not just a feature for that, you know, individual movement moments. Yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, so that's pretty much all for this part. And uh, now let's go to the next one, this isotropic R up energy using Cossie Green invariance. And so this is, uh, you know, uh, the work done by uh, Huan Cheng Lin and Floyd Chitalu and and myself, yeah. And so, uh, so we wanted to like simulate these uh, deformation of the objects, uh, like uh, like doing this kind of like a cloth simulation. And so, uh, yeah, so we think uh, well, I better yes, hurry up, yeah. And so, like computer animation and robotics, we want to like sometimes simulate this kind of like attraction of the cloth and the, the and the robot and human. And so, uh, yeah. So we wish to like have a good, uh, you know, fast simulator for doing this. And uh, also, um, it's better that it is stable. So those are like one of the motivations again for doing this kind of research. And uh, so for doing this, uh, the procedure is that we first define the elastic energy. And at every iteration, we compute the energy gradient and the hesion and uh, like this. And then uh, we are going to like um, 
Yeah, so this is uh, the, the steps that we go through. And then uh, we calculate the displacement by uh, solving this uh, linear equation uh, where this um, displacement is the P and G is uh, the gradient and H is the Hessian. And then uh, we update the particle positions based on this, uh, you know, displacement, yeah. And then uh, we will be able to like calculate the, the location of the vertices in the next frame, yes. And so when uh, doing this, uh, so the cloth is uh, going to go through this kind of like a uh, deformation. And then the, this deformation is, is going to be represented by this, um, you know, this uh, what a deformation gradient, yeah, this F, yeah. Uh, I think uh, you guys know well about this, yeah. And so using this deformation gradient, uh, we can define different types of energy like the the R up and SDBK and Dirichlet and uh, Neil Hokan. Uh, all these kind of energies are exist, and uh, so you can see that they they are basically like checking this, uh, you know, based on this uh, deformation gradient, yeah, and uh, and uh, and so. Uh, so there's something called this Cauchy green variance, uh, which are based on this, uh, you know, the based on this uh, multiplication of this uh, transpose of the of the deformation gradient in itself. And so this, uh, you know, the, there are three uh, deformation gradients. Yeah, uh, actually there are more, but uh, here we we focus on these uh, first three deformation gradients, and these are very useful for like, uh, you know, um, well when you are trying to do this calculation for the gradient and the Hessian. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we need to calculate the gradient and the Hessian for updating the position of the vertices. And so when doing this uh, gradient calculation, so we can uh, you know, uh, use the, this equation that is coming from the chain rule. And so um, by using this, uh, what the cosy green variance, uh, so the calculation of the gradient and the Hessian can be, be simplified a lot, yeah. So, for example, for this calculation of the this uh, gradient, uh, if the energy is this der Dirichlet and or the Neohokian, and you can like uh, this, uh, you know, the energy can be written by you know easily by these quasi green invariants, and then uh, you can like just do some uh, you know derivation of these uh, with the these with the quasi green variance, then the equation of the gradient becomes very, very simple. Yeah, so this, this we can do this kind of a mix and match. Yeah, and so for each of these energies, uh, we can just simply derive the derive them by the, the the invariance, and then the the gradient equation becomes very easy. As we can do the same for the Hessian as well. And if it's like uh, energy like SDVK, again, now uh, we can the energy can be easily uh, described by these quasi green invariants. And again, we can do this mix and match thing so that it becomes the the equation becomes very very simple. Yes, and and so the same for the Hessian. And on the other hand, when we do this with the R up energy, actually we are going to face some issue. Uh, well, before going into that issue, so uh, this uh, power up energy is actually uh, very popular for this kind of uh, shape formation or texture mapping or deep interpolation. Uh, as you, you know, it's been going on for decades. And uh, so, but uh, like if we want to do this uh, mix and match thing with the R up energy, we are going to face some problems. Yeah. So we, you expand this uh, R up energy and then it becomes like this. And then you can replace this one with the quasi green variance. And uh, but and the, this one is uh, simply the, the dimensionality. But uh, this um, trace term is going to remain. Yeah, so this one remains. And you can see that this is difficult to be uh, what replaced by the, the, the quasi green invariance. Yeah. And uh, so then uh, we we don't know how to do this uh, mix and match thing, right? So because of this uh, trace term, yeah. So that's that's an issue. And so uh, well, so that, that so people have been uh, believing it's it's impossible to like use the replace this uh, you know write this trace term with the quasi green variance, yeah. And uh, but uh, then uh, you know uh, my student uh, Huang Cheng was uh, was playing through the math. And um, so we, in fact, uh, these cosy green variants, you can rewrite them by the by the singular values of the, you know, write them in the form of the singular values of the the deformation gradient. Yeah. And and so the you can see that they they are they can be written like this kind of like a polynomials of the singular values. Yeah. 
And uh, so then uh, actually the trace term can also be written in this uh, by the singular values like this. Yeah, so that then it becomes uh, a bit clear why it's difficult to write the trace term with the, the quasi green invariance because the, the trace term is just the summation of the of the singular values where the height, you know, these uh, the quasi green invariants are all high dimensional, uh, you know, polynomials. Yeah. So then uh, it's like, but. But but like actually, uh, you can then uh, do some play around with the math, and so we can first like do some uh, what's a square. We can square this uh, equation on the right first, yeah. And then it's going to be like you can uh, this part becomes squared, and then actually the uh, we can replace some of the parts with the cross degree invariance, and then uh, it becomes like this. And then uh, you can square it again. Actually, you square it again, and then you you notice that all the terms can be uh, replaced by the cross degree invariance. Uh, you, uh, no, not all, but uh, more terms can be re re written with the cross degree invariance and the trace term. Yeah, and so like after all, it it, it becomes like this. Uh, you know, the, we can have we came up with we come up with this kind of like a. a Fourth order, you know, polynomial of the trace term, yeah. and then all the rest parts are like the quotients or are, are and the you know the constants are the quasi green invariants. Yeah, so this is like a equation where of uh, the trace term and and all the rest are the quasi green invariants, and then so we, um, yeah, so in fact, so this kind of like a fourth order uh, polynomial. We can uh, use this, uh, you know, one the Ferrari's, uh, you know, formula for calculating the root. Yeah, so we can solve for the for this root, this trace term actually, and then uh, we will. Uh, after all, it's going to be like you know the using this uh, root of this uh, fourth order polynomial, we can rewrite this R up energy by the quasi green invariance. Yeah, so so the. The details are not shown here because the equation is too long, but uh, there there is a analytical solution for it. Yeah, so so that's uh, represented by this f. Yeah, here. Okay, and uh, so uh, so after all, uh, after uh, this uh, analysis, now we can actually do this. Uh, you know, mix and match thing. So we can like uh, derive the, the these R up energies using the the three Cosigui invariants. And then uh, you know we we can like uh, what come up with a simpler equation, yeah. And then uh, we can easily have like, calculate this uh, gradient uh, and the Hessian uh, with these quasi green invariants. Yeah. And uh, so it becomes like this. And uh, so uh, another uh, yeah. So so well, after all, what what we have uh, shown here is that the quasi you know the R up energy can be written by the quasi you know, of course, the green invariance. Yeah. Another thing uh, that uh, we came up with uh, through this uh, research is that we can we came up with an analytical solution for decomposing the uh, the uh, what the the deformation gradient into the rotation and and stretching term. Yeah. And so uh, so previously, when doing this uh, decomposition, we had to do this SVD. And uh, so that requires, uh, you know, um, what uh, some some iterative calculation, and um, also there was some issue with the with the parallelization, yeah. So because it had to be, well, mostly it was easier to do it on the CPU, so the data were passed to the to the CPU for doing it, um, and then then you have to transfer back, yeah. So that was a bit annoying. And but uh, because uh, we can uh, write this rotation matrix by the you know the, the the partial derivative of the trace term with respect to the deformation gradient, actually uh, we can do something like that mix and match thing. Uh, oh, not mix and match, but the, this uh, you know uh, the chain by the chain using the same chain rule, we we can rewrite it like this. And because we this this f is was the root. Uh, which are written in the form of the fuzzy green invariance, we can have an analytical solution for this. Yeah, so we can have the analytical solution for this. So after all the rotation, we have an analytical solution for the for them. Yeah, and so we can calculate the rotation matrix without the SPD and a polar de or polar decomposition. So it, actually, this is going to be faster than uh, the other methods. Yeah. 
also, uh, because uh, the roots of this uh, fourth order polynomial can, uh, you know, can be written in this uh, form of these, uh, for the singular values of the deformation gradient, actually, we can have a, a closed form solution for the singular values of the deformation gradient, which can be useful in some cases for some energy or doing some finite element analysis. Yeah. And so that's also good. And so let me show some uh, quickly show some examples of uh, using this for like uh, simulating this kind of uh, deformable bunny. And so and also uh, here's another example. Um, this is the same example, sorry. And uh, th this is another example. And or oh, pulling this uh, bunny in different directions. And like uh, uh, here is an what the stress 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 test what this um, you know these uh, points of uh, of this box are randomized in the very beginning and uh, you can see that it's it can stably do the simulation of this kind of like a uh, you know randomly with vertices yeah okay and uh, so um, so here is another example of simulating the the cloth, you know, so it's a pretty simple example, but uh, you yeah, can do these kind of things. And also you can do the shape interpolation, also all, all things that you can do with the RF energy. Now you can do it, voice. it's doing the same thing, but uh, using this uh, analytical, uh, you know, uh, uh, approach, we can do it more quickly. Okay, and now uh, we, because uh, we have like shown that the R up can be written in the form of this Gaussian green invariance, they, it, we can like simulate you know objects with different en energies simultaneously more quickly yeah, using this uh, mix and match thing. Yeah, so you can mix uh, show these uh, simulations based on different energies, and it can be done quickly. Okay, and uh, so uh, regarding this uh, rotation, uh, the calculation of the rotation and stretching from the deformation gradient, uh, actually, it's uh, this operation. I think it, it's used very often and in various uh, situations. And you can see that our method is actually is faster than the existing methods uh, compared to the state of the art. It's one point seven times faster. Compared to the Eigen library, it's uh, three point seven eight times faster. So, so that's uh, useful. Uh, so, uh, I, I didn't put up the website and the slides, but you can uh, search for the for the title and you can download the code. So, if you're interested, please give a try. Okay. And so, in summary, so we have shown that the RF energies can be represented by the quasi green variance, and we also had a closed form solution for the rotation singular values of the deformation gradient. And uh, so thank you very much for, for listening. So, so these are the students who were involved in the, in the research. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Taku, for your excellent talk. Uh, maybe I can take the privilege to ask some questions. Uh, so about the first paper on the periodic autoencoder. Um, yes. Could you explain um, when you extract the features uh, in the um, frequency domain, how to yes. align the like the motion and do the interpolation, like the transition of two motions? Okay. I'm not really get the the detail here. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So the well, so the interpolation of the motion is actually just um, what's happening naturally. So mm -hmm. the point of this one is that it's like computing some, um, you know, features, uh, you know, the, 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 the feature maps. So it's going to be like these kind of like, you know, it's first it's going to be re the dimensionality is reduced. And so each of these, uh, you know, these uh, curves in the lower dimension. Uh, they are converted into this frequency domain. Yeah. So uh, actually, so th these um, motions are somewhat represented in a low dimensional, uh, you know, space where mm -hmm. the variables are like these, uh, you know, these uh, parameters in the in the, in the frequency domain. Yeah. So like the the amplitude, the feet of this uh, frequency, and uh, this uh, offset, the, this kind of uh, parameters. Yeah. So um, uh, the thing is that uh, we are 
uh, we're thinking that the motions are, you know, the, these kind of like a underlying uh, frequency domain, un lower dimensional parameters and the frequency domain are automatically extracted where it's like representing the, which are forming some basis of the movements, yeah. And uh, so, so this kind of like a pattern of the repetitive pattern is automatically extracted. And so by like, you know, synthesizing the motion in this space, uh, we can uh, form, you know, produce uh, nicer movements that considers the nature of the movements, yeah. I see. Okay, so because you learn all kind like different kind of motion together, then you find a common like reduced space, which yeah, can nice. represent like different kind of movement, and then you yes. can do the interpolation on each yes. like basis, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, that's, I see. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, that's the one interpretation. <laughs> yes. Uh, I see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so if there are some like rich contact happens um mm -hmm. did you see there any problem for like very limited uh -huh. number of frequency mm, right yeah so the motion that involves the contacts are mainly like the quadruped locomotion and uh where which were the other ones i, I think yeah the, i mean the other ones are also still like the locomotions that mm -hmm. we've seen through and so if it's uh, you know, it's uh, probably a good idea to try with these uh, contact rich movements like the basketball or like, you know, like the sitting on the chair. Well, the basketball is probably interesting because there's lots of high frequency movements there. Mm. It's, mm. It's, it's if it can reproduce these movements, that's 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 better. Um, uh, I, at this moment, we haven't done such experiments, but that's uh, definitely good to try. Yeah. I see. And do you think this kind of framework is suitable for, for the manipulation task? Oh, the manipulation task, yeah. So yeah. that's uh, a, good, a good question. So like, I think in, in general, these are better for like these uh, repetitive movements where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, there's where it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's lots of, uh, you know, uh, periods and, and phases are involved um, for the manipulation. Um, it's uh, difficult to say, I think. Yeah, so <laughs> well, yeah, actually, yeah, because we were previously trying something like the the local phase uh, representation for the manipulation uh, when handling the manipulation uh, data. And mm -hmm. in that case, it, it wasn't working so well. <laughs> so like, uh, uh, because the hand motions are a bit different from like this locomotion data because the contacts happen very quickly and mm -hmm. like you know um yeah the the coordination between the fingers happen in a bit different way from locomotion so it's a bit uh, difficult to say i think it's interesting to, to give a try for that too yeah okay thanks um and another question for the uh, for the second paper um right, i saw smart. you you uh, you use the the invariance as the variable to formulate, like to give a like a unified formulation of the elasticity energy. Um, uh -huh. I know there are some work that directly use the principal stretch, like the the eigenvalue, as the uh -huh. variable to uh -huh. to formulate all kinds of like elasticity energy. So right, was, right, right, yeah, right. yeah, was the like benefit. Uh, uh, we can gain from using the like the the invariance rather than the the eigenvalue. Uh -huh. uh, so like uh, that's uh, that's a very uh, difficult for me to answer. <laughs> um, yeah, this this one. Um, yeah, so it's, I'm still just learning from my students and RAs and like at Florida, Fengsheng and Florida and Kemei. Mm -hmm. But uh, is that what? Well, one thing that uh, we can you can benefit from this uh, what, from this research is that this this uh, you know this uh, analytical solution for this uh, decomposition yeah for for the mm -hmm. rotation and stretching yeah so uh, because we have like the analytical solution we can directly calculate the, the stretching uh, you know from from this from the deformation gradient 
uh, which is going to be faster and also like uh, so you can like uh, use uh, you know, many energies are I think based on this uh, this uh, stretching term and also like the the singular values are so so because we have these uh, analytical solutions for them you can like you know uh, quickly obtain them without uh, this uh, recursive calculation and mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, one of the benefits yeah mm. totally differentiable right uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So we okay. uh, think that it's also useful. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it can be used for the like the material interference, some task like this, like the inverse mm -hmm. learning task. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully it's it's used <laughs> for such purpose as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks so much.